Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Claudine Chevrier. I am a knowledge translation project manager and the lead on tuberculosis at the National Collaborative Center for Infectious Diseases, the NCCID. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the state of tuberculosis surveillance in Canada, landscape and ways forward. So I will be your moderator today. Uh, before we get started, I want to say that the NCCID is hosted at the University of Manitoba, which is uh, on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg, Dakota Oyate, Tenesulin, Nehetowak, uh, and Inin, uh, uh, excuse me, Ininwak nations. It's also right in the heart of the homeland of the Métis Nation. At NCCID, we strive to honor the lands and their original caretakers in our work. We acknowledge that we're on Treaty 1 land. We recognize that this and other treaties have been implemented as part of the process of colonization, which was intended to benefit some while harming others. We're committed to working with our partners towards reconciliation. And CCID is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to support the expanding area of knowledge translation and exchange of infectious diseases research for public health. So a few housekeeping items I want to mention before we get started with the good stuff. Uh, we are running this through Zoom, as I'm sure everyone here has noticed. And again, as I'm sure everyone here is uh, more of an expert on Zoom than they never they ever thought they would be. Uh, still, if you have any issues, technical issues, you can email nccid at nccid at umanitoba.ca, nccid at umanitoba.ca. The question and answer session today will be focused on today's topic, which is, of course, the state of tuberculosis surveillance in Canada. The session will take place in the using the Q&A tab that you can see below. Um, the, we will also use the chat tab for communication with participants, so keep an eye on that. Um, and the recording of this webinar, which has started, will be available after the webinar at nccid.ca. So today's webinar will consider the current state of TB surveillance in Canada and what a robust strategic plan could achieve for TB elimination. We're lucky to have such distinguished speakers ready to share their expertise with us today uh, to continue the conversation on this important topic. The webinar will consist of five presentations. Uh, I will invite everyone to keep your questions for the very end of all presentations, although you can go ahead and write them in the, in the Q&A tab at any point. And I will be introducing our speakers as we go along. So the first presentation will be by Dr. Jonathan Campbell. Dr. Campbell is an assistant professor at McGill University with expertise in economic evaluation, epidemiology, and a research focus on tuberculosis. He's interested in informing the design, cost, and implementation of interventions and programs to support tuberculosis elimination in Canada and globally. He's also interested in, in investigating how best to design and implement surveillance activities to ensure to respond to the needs uh, of end users and are informative for public, uh, uh, sorry, public health activities. Dr. Campbell, the floor is yours. Thanks, Claudine. And Thanks everyone for joining today. I'm gonna to try and share my slides here. Thinking that's working. All right, yeah, thanks for the, uh, the thumbs up. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna give an introductory talk uh, that really will set the stage for the other panelists, um, I would say I might have probably the least interesting talk of everyone here. Um, so I think there's a lot of really interesting perspectives that we'll hear uh, from Dr. Heffernan, uh, Wong, Cook, and Obed uh, down the line. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the state of TB surveillance in Canada. So it should come as no surprise to people here that surveillance is really our TB epidemiology backbone. It's how we, it's what we use to monitor progress moving forward, trends, identify patterns. Uh, it's for monitoring. Um, although in Canada, 
a lot of our surveillance activities um, are, are for monitoring. It should, could also be used for evaluation. And I think that's one of the areas where we have an opportunity to really improve our surveillance data and leverage it uh, in a more efficient manner is to move on from surveillance as something simply for monitoring and make it truly multi-purpose. So I'll briefly go over a few opportunities that I think we have to improve TB surveillance in Canada. The first is looking at, and I'll expand on these more in the coming slides. The first is the timeliness of surveillance reporting. The second is trying to improve the utility of the collected surveillance data, looking to improve access and use of surveillance data. And a major cross-cutting uh, issue here is coordinating a national response to TB. So I think this is one of the key things here is surveillance is one of these cogs in uh, coordinating and guiding our national response to TB. And without high quality surveillance data, we really uh, you know, end up being the blind leading the blind uh, moving forward. So when I speak about timeliness of surveillance data, this here is a graph comparing how long it takes to report uh, annual surveillance data comparing Canada and the United States over the past 21 years. So you can see in the bottom graph, the United States um, in the circles and Canada in the triangles. Um, the United States generally releases a high level preliminary report uh, with provisional data uh, on World TB Day for the preceding year. So for the calendar year 2022, uh, they reported provisional data um, on March 24th, 2023. Uh, Canada, on the other hand, instead of reaching this you know, three month mark for provisional data, we usually take about 15 months to get there. So on World TB Day this year, we reported our provisional data for 2021 reporting year. And on average, our full reports don't come out for about two years uh, until two years after the reporting date, uh, the end year for surveillance data. Well, in the United States, it's about 10 months, usually in October the following year, a full report is released. And then if we added 2021 to this, of course, we do not have a full report for 2021 yet. Uh, yet, uh, if we're following the trends of uh, last year in 2020, we got the full report uh, in August 2022. And what this really means is that a lot of our surveillance data that is released is kind of looking into the past. It's not really something that's informing the current context. And if we look at this massive delay here, uh, that end triangle where you see the 2018 data wasn't reported actually until uh, 2022. So we had a four year gap uh, from the close of 2017 before we even knew what the snapshot of 2018 was. And really this meant that during COVID, we had no idea what was going on with tuberculosis in Canada until frankly, it was too late to do anything about it. I think we have opportunities to improve the utility of collected data. Um, now we have case report forms for tuberculosis, which collect very detailed data on the people who develop TB, the number of contacts and their outcomes. But the last update was in January, 2011. So over a decade ago, and if we look to our neighbors in the South, you know, their last update was in 2020. So they're current, constantly revising and improving their case report forms. And what this ends up meaning is that we end up with case definitions such as for certain forms of extrapulmonary TB that have changed since January 2011 and are, might have been adopted in differential ways by different provinces and territories. And, there, and the guidance notes uh, that countries are, uh, sorry, that provinces and territories are supposed to use to report um, forms of tuberculosis are over a decade old and not keeping up with current case definitions, which means that we might not be saying the same thing province to province ter or province to territory. Because we haven't updated uh, our case report form since January 2011, uh, it's very possible that our case report forms aren't collecting all the important information we need. You know, we lack key details, and I think one of them uh, that's easy to highlight is on pregnancy and postpartum. Those, aren't, those details aren't collected uh, on case report forms, but it's well recognized uh, that people who are pregnant or in the postpartum period 
are at higher risk for developing TB and for poorer outcomes. And, but we do not collect any of this data so that we can track how well uh, we are managing TB in this population. And there's certain data that we collect, such as symptoms uh, uh, at diagnosis, that is quite ambiguous in the guidance notes and leads to probably inconsistent reporting. So the utility of our surveillance data is impacted by three Cs here. Um, completeness, you know, is everyone collecting the same data? Consistency, is everyone collecting the same data the same way? And comprehensiveness, is everyone collecting the data we need to make decisions? And I think if we haven't updated our case report forms and guidance from January 2011, uh, and we're now in, by my count, May 2023, um, we're likely not in that state of comprehensiveness. Uh, we might not be in that state of consistency. And I, I, I'm gonna guess we're also not at, in that state of completeness as well. So we can also work to improve access to surveillance data, right? Anyone who's tried to look at surveillance data knows that there's very limited data released publicly and we lack formal mechanisms to request and receive such data at the national level. So what gets reported in national reports is typically all that's available and there's very small data sets that you can access that have uh, some, some data that's usually just stratified by age and sex. Um, and the details included in the reports are not necessarily exhaustive or address the issues relevant to impacted communities. Uh, provinces and territories. Now you can think of provinces and territories and impacted communities, uh, how they would have interest in comparative analyses. For example, how well um, certain provinces and territories are managing TB among people living with HIV. Be interesting to see how outcomes are uh, in that population by province and territory so that there can be lessons learned and shared on why potentially outcomes are different. Of course, you can't do these search sorts of analyses if you're not collecting the data that's relevant. And we all know that research data, that research is only as good as the quality of the data that underlies it. And surveillance data that can, detailed surveillance data can definitely improve the quality and relevance of research uh, for impacted communities and for TB elimination efforts. So I think that formal mechanisms that also respect data sovereignty and have strong governance structures so we're thinking of data privacy and security and making sure that people are using the right data for the right reasons with the right permissions could be established to improve the utility of collected surveillance data in Canada. So I think we have a few concrete steps to improve TB surveillance. Um, you know, back in 2011, we had a disbanded, disbanded uh, the Canadian TB committee so I think trying to go and reestablish a Canadian TB elimination advisory committee that has representation from provincial and territorial leads and impacted populations is an important first step, not only to improve TB surveillance, but to get us on the track towards elimination. On that first slide, I showed you very flat, sometimes increasing rates of TB in Canada. Our case report forms haven't been updated. I think we need a countrywide consultation on TB surveillance needs with a view to improve the comprehensiveness and consistency of data reported to make sure we're collecting the right data and in the right way. You know, all of the issues here could come back down to resources and funding available for TB surveillance. So I think it's essential that we allocate funding and prioritize surveillance, which is gonna be essential for accurate, timely and accessible surveillance data. We saw the role of surveillance during, uh, during COVID and as it continues to be important for that. I think for TB, we can't simply turn a blind eye. We need to allocate funding and prioritize it um, to make important steps forward. And I think what would help all of this is having monitorable and precise goals for TB elimination. I believe we had a, a national goal that was set for 2015 uh, of about three and a half cases per 100,000 population. We're now sitting at around five per 100,000 population, actually increasing from when we set that initial goal. And we haven't set any monitorable or precise goals moving forward. And I think having these, these goals here is, and making sure that it can be directly measured uh, would support accountability and allow us to strive for better.
And finally, building on that, surveillance is essential to achieve elimination. So in the in uh, a few months ago, we released uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada released um, their high level infographic for 2021, and they put this in there. Uh, how we aim to achieve TB elimination, enhancing current efforts to prevent and control TB disease, facilitating identification and treatment of TB infection, championing correct collaborative action against underlying risk factors, and ensuring and ensuring approaches are community driven and equitable. I think surveillance has a role in all of these uh, aims. Surveillance data can be used to measure and evaluate programs and interventions. We just need to use it in the right way, not simply as a monitoring tool, but as an evaluation tool. And this can improve the implementation of these efforts. If we developed a national platform for TB infection surveillance, perhaps through sentinel, certain sentinel sites and, and provinces with decentralized systems, or formalizing reporting procedures and centralized systems where all people are who are treated for TB infection are treated uh, in the same centers. This can support the implementation and scale up of TPT. TB surveillance data can also facilitate the measurement and monitoring measurement and monitoring of the impact of underlying risk factors of TB risk and outcomes in Canada. Unfortunately, only about half of people who uh, are diagnosed with TB disease have complete records on comorbid conditions and these underlying risk factors uh, for TB. And to ensure approaches are community driven with a health equity lens, we can use surveillance data to set specific monitorable metrics of equity, which can be leveraged to determine the success of these approaches. So I think really we have a lot of potential uh, in the surveillance data that we collect already. We can improve that data that we collect and we can make and we can put it to use to help us work towards elimination. With that, I'll stop here. And uh, if you wanna read more, uh, we have a commentary uh, in the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. Um, I just want to invite everyone uh, to write questions if you have some, as some I've already done uh, in the Q&A, and we can answer them at the very end um, of all the presentations. So our next, next speaker is Dr. Courtney Effernan. Uh, Dr. Effernan currently calls Edmonton in Treaty 6 territory her home, uh, but she's been fortunate to live all across Canada from PEI to the home of the world's tallest moose statue, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Um, and many of Ontario's towns and cities in between. She received her PhD in medicine from the University of Alberta in 2020, and since 2010 has been working as the manager of the TB Program Evaluation and Research Unit. Her work is focused on TB elimination with an emphasis on transmission in underserved groups, surveillance, monitoring, and reporting. She's also a member of Stop TB Canada Steering Committee and the CBC's TB Trials Consortium Implementation and Quality Committee. Dr. Effernan, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, thank you, Claudine, and thank you to so many people who are attending either uh, during their breakfast or lunch. It's uh, so great to see so many people on the line. Uh, like Jonathan, I am going to attempt to share my screen. And similarly, I have a very high level presentation for this morning. So I would call this the second most boring presentation, um, if I could be so bold. And hopefully everyone can see the slides that are up on the screen. Um, okay, I got a thumbs up, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, I am going to just try and connect the dots between uh, surveillance, which as Jonathan so um, aptly described is information and monitoring, which is um, kind of a utility for these types of data. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some recommendations that were made in the uh, most recent edition of the Canadian tuberculosis standards. Um, but first, I'd like to say that I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory. Uh, this is homeland of Métis, and this is a picture of me with my uh, two dogs, Leia in the front. Uh, she's a senior border collie, and uh, Roy to the side, he's a little orange hamburger, um, or I guess a, a big orange hamburger. Um, this is me in Ward Métis, and uh, 
I'm represented by uh, Alberta's only Indigenous uh, MP, Member of Parliament, uh, Blake Desjardins, who's Cree and Métis. And I'd just like to uh, emphasize this at the beginning to say that this demonstrates to me the value of doing a land acknowledgement to show sort of an unbroken uh, line of strength and resilience among Indigenous peoples on the lands that we call home. Um, and uh, seeing uh, Indigenous peoples rise to leadership is just phenomenal. Um, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, program performance monitoring as described in the 15th chapter of the Canadian TV standards, why we should do it. Um, and then I'll go through uh, some of the methods that we used to uh, design a framework. I'll talk about what the framework is and what it isn't. And uh, as Claudine mentioned, we'll reserve questions to the very end. So surveillance uh, is uh, for a long time in Canada uh, as an observer has been um, uh, data collection, it's been counting, um, but surveillance should actually, uh, it's intended to be disease reporting for action. Um, so it should be the cornerstone of public health interventions. The data should provide, uh, should be analyzed in ways that help determine who, where, what, um, how. And so uh, if it's appropriately analyzed, then these data can be connected to performance monitoring and uh, evaluations that assess resource management, the quality of services, and whether best practices are being implemented or not. If not, why not? Um, and so we're gonna cover uh, these things in this uh, overview this morning. So program performance monitoring, uh, it, it takes multiple forms, but uh, in the form that we've presented in this chapter, we use performance measurement, which is a type of evaluation that answers questions about the quality and value of services. This would include public health services, so uh, TV program service. It should create valuable information for performance management and program management. So that's the what you do with the information. So somebody has to be. Um, accountable for making use of the data. So uh, its use is to review services and programs, assess and revise goals and objectives, assess progress against targets, which uh, as we know, have already been established. Those are politically stated goals. Um, and uh, they can also be used uh, for more uh, management type uh, uh, goals such as conducting employee evaluations and to formulate and justify budgets. So it's essential that performance measurement is uh, considered to be an inherent and indispensable part of the management process. And it's described as contributing to better decision making by managers, uh, more informed individual and organizational uh, performance appraisals. Um, it, really should be fostering accountability and responsibility, um, improved service performance, and that's to end users um, by the service providers. Uh, and it, it should engender greater interest uh, by the public through clear reporting. So um, in, the, in this chapter, we recommend making performance monitoring um, um, data that are collected at each level public um, so that there is a transparency between um, users and providers. Um, and it should improve civic discourse based on factual and specific reporting. So why should we do it? Um, so systematic program evaluation, it, it is promoted in the end TB strategy, which is sort of globally applicable. Um, and evaluations are meant to separate programs that promote health, prevent injury and disease or disability from those that do not. So it should be uh, a, a way to um, demonstrate um, effectiveness. So performance measurement generates evidence of change, which would be progress towards goals, like for example, TB elimination. It can be used to identify areas where programs can be 
improved. Um, so if you're falling short of a specific target, for example, um, and it can demonstrate the results of resource investments. So uh, TB programs are, are funded and they are resource intensive. So there has to be um, sort of uh, justification for um, those resource investments. So as a result, program performance monitoring of TB server, uh, services supports regional and national implementation of the three strategic pillars of the NTB strategy. So first, you have monitoring that generates evidence about the provision of high quality patient centered prevention and care, which would be pillar one. Um, it provides evidence of value to encourage increased political will towards actions like elimination. Um, that's uh, pillar two. And finally, the results of uh, monitoring and evaluation can help direct research and innovation by pinpointing program areas that require change. So uh, this is something, um, program evaluation and monitoring of TB services that's been discussed in Canada for more than 20 years. Um, so notably, these discussions have been led by Health Canada, uh, the Pan-Canadian Public Health Network, and Inuit Tapirit Kanantami, which we'll hear about um, in more detail later this morning. But um, a comprehensive um, national framework does not yet exist. But in the same period, uh, progress on the ultimate indicator, uh, or what I think we can all agree would be the hard target uh, of success, which would be a substantial reduction in cases as measured by incidents, has not yet been achieved. So we see here um, in the blue line, this is showing the actual incidence of tuberculosis in Canada from 1989 to 2019. Um, and we see projected rates that are based on pre-elimination targets that have previously been set for Canada um, in 1997, uh, 2006, and again, uh, the NTB uh, targets that were set in 2015. And you can see um, in 1997, we're sort of on track, on track, on track, and then uh, things got a little uh, out of out of hand. Um, and similarly, the target set in 2006, which Jonathan touched on, uh, were on track, on track, on track, and then things got away from us. But in 2015, uh, we sort of never got a handle on things. And um, I don't want to infer cause and effect, but this is um, after the Canadian uh, TB committee was disbanded. And so um, there's been no forum to uh, uh, dis discuss kind of shared challenges and, and also shared opportunities, um, which I think, uh, as was previously mentioned, is so critical. Um, <clears throat> so these are just the incidents uh, targets that were applicable to Canada. Uh, so the 1997 uh, target was to reduce incident cases by 5% per annum. Um, and like I said, kind of achieving, achieving, and then stopped achieving. Um, and in 2006, we were meant to achieve a, an incidence rate of 3.6 per 100,000 by, by 2015. And um, we're almost not quite double that, but one and a half times now. So way off target. And then uh, the NTB strategy has come along and uh, the, the targets are to reduce incidents by 90% compared to 2015 by 2030, and then to achieve a rate of one per million population by 2050. And um, we've had what uh, is ostensibly a flat line of incidents uh, for about 15 years. So we're not making very good progress. Um, and then uh, ITK, they'll be talking more this morning um, about um, uh, their elimination uh, strategy, uh, but the, the target was to reduce incidents by 50% compared to 2018 by 2025 and uh, to reach elimination by 2030. And um, it's very, exciting and ambitious and I, I love to hear more about um, uh, elimination uh, that is kind of population and uh, jurisdictionally uh, specific. 
Um, but with regards to this chapter that was meant to um, apply to all TB programs uh, uh, across Canada, uh, the methods that we followed were just to conduct a, a scoping review um, that uh, led to a list of 105 possible performance indicators. And CCID uh, hosted a national conference in 2018 with stakeholders from the TB community um, from public health, uh, Indigenous community representation um, uh, was at, at the uh, this conference, and uh, the there were iterative rounds of anonymous ranking in a modified Delphi technique was applied, and eight performance indicators came from that national uh, conference that were applicable to high priority population groups, and they were agreed to by consensus. Um, but with regards to this chapter, um, we made some additions and substitutions through facilitated rounds of negotiations among the writing team. And this is because, um, the chapter is sort of more broadly applicable. So we were sort of constraining our view um, by pragmatism. So uh, we followed um, some central principles uh, that indicators would be consistent. So all programs would measure the same thing across all, jurisdic all jurisdictions and uh, compare so that we could compare programs with others that it would be a collaborative process so that uh, we could get buy-in from key community partners by meeting with them to establish and validate program objectives, that uh, the objectives were manageable, so they're kept to the essential minimum, um, measurable, um, so that they're clearly defining uh, numerators and denominators and uh, everything's sort of clearly defined so that we can measure the same thing across jurisdictions, um, which leads to relative performance comparisons, um, which is helpful for um, organizing conversations about shared challenges and opportunities. Um, and also that these reports be timely so that uh, data are regularly reported. And finally, uh, that they would be um, disaggregated sufficiently to show among whom the program uh, should be prioritizing or who the program might be missing so that uh, program delivery can be recalibrated to meet the higher needs of uh, the most vulnerable users. Um, I won't go into uh, too much detail on uh, what the, the framework looks like. It's published in the in the standards, but we use quantitative measures of performance, um, which are our targets. Um, and we provide definitions for those. So I'll just give some examples. Uh, so the, the primary uh, key indicator is um, uh, is a reduction in the annual incidence of uh, TB in all of its forms to um, the elimination targets that have been set in the NTB uh, strategy. And um, there is one um, objective for measuring the performance of an existing program, which is the immigration medical exam and its um, um, relationship to uh, post-landing surveillance. And then we have objectives for case management and treatment, uh, also objectives for contact management. And um, it, it's kind of uh, delineated by uh, pulmonary cases and their context, just to ensure that um, sort of the public health aspects of TB are front and center so that um, um, uh, when we're thinking about a reduction of incidents, we're really focused on the, the, the public health significance and that um, performance should be optimized in um, across these measures um, before moving on, I guess, to um, maybe more, more fancy um, evaluative um, metrics. So what, what can we do with this? Um, we really recommend in this chapter that the the data are consistently uh, presented and also analyzed by age, sex, and population uh, groups so that there is a maintenance uh, of focus where there's a greatest need for service. Um, 
and this is just aligned with um, uh, best practices globally. But we also um, suggest that uh, depending on local decisions that programs should collect or link with other data um, that might include other significant social strata of risk, which would include things like HIV status or persons experiencing houselessness, or limited labor participation or high risk occupations, um, or recently experiencing incarceration. So it is a broad uh, framework, but it can really be um, kind of specified to the program that's uh, implementing it. Um, and we recommend that this is done annually and that it's done kind of under the leadership of uh, the clinical TB consultant um, or program manager because they're best uh, positioned within the program to implement change. So they're the ultimate knowledge users of the reports. Um, and it's crucial that they oversee the process and develop a mechanism to properly engage stakeholder groups uh, going forward. Um, so if it's annual, you can assess local serial performance. And if it's consistent, uh, as I mentioned, you can assess relative performance. Um, and this is just uh, an image of the standards where this is uh, published, but um, we're gonna hear more from uh, Tom Wong this morning and Raymond Obed, uh, Indigenous Services Canada, um, uh, previously through as uh, FUNIB and Health Canada had uh, their own monitoring and performance framework for TV programs for First Nations on reserve. I believe that this goes back to 2012 or 2014 and um, ITKs we'll hear more about, but these are sort of the the two uh, monitoring frameworks that have been published at the national level already. So um, there's more reading and some um, thanks to uh, the hosts and um, co-authors. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Evernen, for a not at all boring and very informative uh, presentation. Um, so I'm just going to remind everyone to make sure to write down your questions in the Q&A tab so we have them for each presentation for the end. Uh, so for our third speaker, we are lucky to have Dr. Tom Wong with us today. Uh, Dr. Wong is the Director General for the Office of Population and Public Health. He is also the Chief Medical Officer of Public Health and the Chief Science Officer at the First Nation and Inuit Health Branch of Indigenous Service Canada. He was trained in family medicine, internal medicine, infectious diseases, and public health at McGill, Harvard, and Columbia. His public health work includes engagement with Indigenous communities, HIV, hepatitis C, sexually transmitted infections, tuberculosis, influenza, vaccine preventable diseases, antimicrobial resistance, chronic diseases, mental health, addiction, and health disparities. Dr. Wong sits on multiple national and international committees and has academic appointments with both the University of Ottawa and the University of Toronto. Dr. Wong, thank you so much for joining us, and I will start your presentation immediately. Hello, everyone. Uh, Kwe Kwe, uh, bonjour. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I'm joining you from today is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. I would also like to take a moment to thank NCCID team for the kind invitation to speak. Today, I'll be speaking about the role of surveillance data in informing Indigenous-led TB elimination strategies, uh, culturally safe care, and the path ahead. As we move towards eliminating TB in Canada as a country, it is important to have discussions on what equitable TB surveillance is, why it is needed, and how it can be utilized in TB elimination strategies. Perhaps the next slide, please. TB disproportionately impacts people experiencing social inequities. Indigenous communities continue to be disproportionately affected. The graphic on the right shows the latest 2021 publicly released information 
on active TB reported incidents. And this data come from provinces and territories in collaboration with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Next slide, please. The slide here shows the time trend of annual incidence rates of reported new active TB cases among First Nations on reserve when compared to the general Canadian population. This widening disparity during the COVID pandemic in Canada uh, needs the redoubling of our collective efforts. Next slide, please. Surveillance data when aligned with Indigenous rights to self-determination and data sovereignty can act as a catalyst for Indigenous-led strategic planning and decision-making in TB prevention control and ultimately elimination. In collaboration with provinces and territories and Indigenous partners, the Stop TB Canada Network identified key recommendations to help inform the development of a national TB elimination strategy in Canada, depicted here. These recommendations include addressing social determinants of health and addressing the barriers to TB services and implementing a timely TB surveillance infrastructure. Next slide, please. It is important to support distinctions-based Indigenous-led TB data gathering, data analysis, and data utilization to inform Indigenous-led actions and interventions. As we see here, uh, Inuit is even more disproportionately affected by TB than other Indigenous peoples and foreign-born populations. Next slide, please. Communities need to be supported to track progress by communities to set objectives and measure the progress towards TB elimination. TB data must be collected, analyzed, interpreted, and distributed in an equitable fashion. The First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession of data and the National Inuit Strategy on Research are distinctions-based Indigenous-created principles to support Indigenous control over data. Next slide, please. One example of how data have informed public health actions includes the First Nations Health and Social Secretariat of Manitoba. As we see here, First Nations in Manitoba have been tracking COVID cases and the vaccine uptake rate, hospitalization and death, and posting all of that information on the website regularly. And First Nations led data resulted in a coordinated COVID response that prioritized indigenous peoples in Manitoba and addressed inequities. Next slide, please. In 2018, there was a significant TB outbreak in Nunavut, affecting a number of communities. Informed by up-to-date surveillance and outbreak data, different levels of government, including an ISC and PHAC response, worked together to support affected Inuit communities in outbreak prevention and response. Next slide, please. In order to improve the use and collection of distinctions-based Indigenous-led TB surveillance data and in turn support TB elimination, we would need resources to enhance community capacity, nationwide engagement, collaboration, and co-development of strategies, efforts, setting measurable goals, and supporting community capacity building in Indigenous-led surveillance efforts and a distinctions-based data sovereignty. Why is data uh, important? Why are distinctions-based data sovereignty issues important? Distinctions-based data sovereignty is important because a distinctions-based approach acknowledges the distinct needs, interests, and priorities of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Indigenous data sovereignty is a crucial step towards ensuring that Indigenous values, rights, and interests guide decision-making about how data are collected and how data are utilized. 
Next slide, please. Thank you for your time. Merci, Mikwich, Nakumik, and Marcy. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for this great presentation. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I just want to uh, remind people, uh, as we're getting more and more questions in the Q&A tab, that if there's a question that you really want to see answered, you can press the little like button and it will. you can vote up questions uh, in case you are very invested in getting an answer from our distinguished speakers today. Um, so uh, our next speaker is Dr. Victoria Cook. Uh, so since 20, uh, 2002, Dr. Cook has worked at the BC Center for Disease Control. Currently, she's the medical head of the Provincial TB Services, uh, which allows her to provide tuberculosis care across the province. Dr. Cook, over to you. There, can you, can you hear me and can you see the slide? Super, thanks very much. Um, so thank you very much for having me. I'm actually very excited to be here. And I, I always love uh, coming together with people that are keen on tuberculosis. It's, you know, being with colleagues and being with friends. So, and I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm, I'm calling in uh, from the West Coast. So from, um, from Vancouver. And I, I certainly acknowledge that I am incredibly lucky to live and work and play on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. And that includes uh, the territories of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And what I'm going to do is try to give a little bit of a provincial perspective on what we're talking about today, which is the state of TB surveillance in Canada, landscape and ways forward. So again, as I, I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm on the West Coast, so I'm in Vancouver, and I'm based mainly out of the BC Center for Disease Control. And my role within the BCCDC as, is as a physician lead of the provincial TB program. And I think it's probably important just to give, the, give folks a little bit of a lay of how things work within, uh, within uh, BC. And we're very lucky we have uh, great collaborations with uh, uh, the First Nations Health Authority as well as our regional partners in the geographic health authorities. And within the provincial TB program, we have, I have it italicized and, you know, we have sort of a quasi centralized program. So it's not, it's not perfect, but for the most part, a lot of the clinical care with respect to tuberculosis is organized through um, the provincial program and through our central clinics in Vancouver and New Westminster, where we provide direct clinical care. We also have a consultation service and a virtual care service where we provide support to clients and healthcare providers outside of the lower mainland. And one of the other things that we're very, very lucky for is that within the same building, um, I work very closely with the public health laboratory. So all of the mycobacteriology lab is, is uh, within, within a walking distance. The provincial TB pharmacy, where we have access to tuberculin TB medications. We also have certainly great support when we're looking at trying to access more complicated medication regimens for some patients. We have an affiliation with the University of British Columbia. So we're involved in training and education obviously in research collaborations, both locally and more broadly. And then given what we're talking about today, we have a very robust surveillance program within, uh, within the center. So since we're talking about data, I thought the first slide I would show is just to give folks a little bit of a perspective about what things are like in BC. And this really is just looking at uh, plane incidents, um, comparing BC, which is the blue line, to the national rate, which is the yellow line. And for as long as I have been at uh, the, at the provincial TB program, British Columbia has always had an incident rate that has been greater than the national average. You can also look at data, and we look at data from a geographic perspective. And so this is actually split, this is incident split um, through health service delivery areas. And so the uh, map on the left-hand side obviously shows you that we have a variable incidence of tuberculosis across the province. Uh, and then moving to the, uh, the inset that I've blown up there on the, on the right-hand side, you'll see that when we just look at pure incidents across the, uh, across the province, you'll see that the greatest rates of tuberculosis can be seen in sort of the more urban centers. And, and that, uh, the sort of darker areas you see in the map there are um, in and around the Vancouver Lower Mainland into the Fraser Valley. This next slide is giving a sense of of who gets tuberculosis within BC. And in some ways, we're very similar to some of the other uh, provinces 
in the country where there is a, a, a large number of, of new migrants coming into, into Canada that settle. And so the vast majority of our cases in British Columbia are in people born outside of the country. And that's reflected there in the, in the red line. And as you can see, these are case counts. Uh, that red line has been increasing over time. And the proportion of cases that are diagnosed in people born outside of the country is uh, upwards of 80, getting closer to 85% of our cases within the province of British Columbia. So when we look at data, as I said, we have a robust surveillance program and there's a number of external facing reports that are available to people. They're available on our website and I have the link there attached there at the bottom of the slide. Um, we have, obviously we have annual reports that are, are publicly available. These annual reports contain what you would imagine they would contain. So there's information related to active case diagnosis and treatment and outcomes. There's information regarding uh, latent TB, treatment starts and outcomes. There's also some contact tracing cascades that are available. And then we also present um, and have available a quarterly report uh, that is essentially, and it includes diseases other than tuberculosis, so there's information about syphilis and, um, and gonorrhea, um, but within tuberculosis we'll present our, our case counts, uh, they're split into by region, by age, and, and by gender. We also have um, a, sort of a neat tool which is available on the website, and again the link is there, which is a reportable diseases dashboard. And as you can see, you can see there in, in, in red font, there's a bit of a caveat that the data within this has not been updated since 2019. And essentially that is uh, because of the shift in, in, in public health uh, towards uh, pandemic management. And as you can see, what I've given you is a little screenshot of the dashboard. Uh, you can select your disease. So we're talking about tuberculosis. I made sure that we had TB under the selection of disease. You can pick a health region and it will give you case counts, um, incidents, and again, through by regional health authority age and by gender. And so that's sort of a neat tool uh, that, is, that is publicly um, facing and publicly available. We also have uh, developed um, some internal uh, reports and essentially a lot of these were developed around the time of the pandemic because obviously there were some concerns regarding uh, shifting public health uh, focus. The uh, um, map on the, on the, on the left-hand side sort of shows you a moving average of case counts uh, by quarter. And then on the, on the right-hand side, you see the histogram of blue bars and uh, this is actually a really sort of telling slide for, for, for us in BC and certainly I imagine in other areas have experienced the same thing around, around tuberculosis in that these are uh, latent TB treatment starts and the uh, red arrow sort of reflects when the first lockdown started to happen with respect to the pandemic and things really started to shift and change uh, in public health. And you'll see that over the three year period, we really have yet to recover to the number of latent TB treatment starts that we were having pre-pandemic. And it's really something that we were tracking and monitoring and is something of, uh, of, of great concern. Certainly when you look at, based on the first epi slide that I, or, or the first slides that I showed you around our epidemiology where you see uh, really the vast majority of the patients that we see with tuberculosis um, are born outside of the country. And so our uh, patients that might have latent TB infection and there's the opportunity to look at ways to prevent um, progression to active disease. Uh, and I think just re reflecting a little bit on the prior uh, speakers is, you know, we've we've looked at what has what's come out of the Canadian TB standards, and and again all of the performance indicators that have been flagged as uh, as reasonable targets. And based on what we already do with respect to surveillance within the provinces, we're pretty good. We can actually uh, report on the majority of the indicators that are listed within uh, the new standards. And where we have um, we have gaps and challenges is mainly around indicator four and 4.1, which is uh, under contact tracing. And some of that reflects how things work within the province of British Columbia, where uh, the, the majority of some public health follow-up that happens, happens within the regions and happens uh, within FNHA. And there are um, some contact um, uh, information that does not make it into the, um, the provincial registry. And so the uh, graph on your right hand side is a contact cascade and essentially what this uh, shows me is that you know we have 
a, a, a challenging denominator we, where we have the denominator of contacts that are actually referred to the provincial TB program, but that doesn't necessarily equate to the number of contacts that might be identified in the context of a contact investigation. So I think having shared some of the, 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 the strong features that we have within the surveillance program and some of the reports that are available and that um, help us understand what's happening from a provincial perspective, you know, surveillance as we're hearing is not without challenges. And I think one of the, one of the challenges with respect to TB is why people like myself, who, you know, who's a clinician love tuberculosis. It's a really complex disease. Clinically, it's a complex disease. And there's a very longitudinal nature uh, with respect to the disease that allows us to have relationships with patients over time. But there is a delay with the latency. There is also a delay and a perceived delay around reporting. I think that there's also a difficulty in sometimes classing, classifying really important surveillance elements. And you know, we use a lot of free text and free text is incredibly robust, but it is very hard to categorize when you're looking at trying to automate reports. And I think within the province of BC, we have a, a TB registry and our registry is a clinical system that we use, but it's also our surveillance system. And there are pros and cons to that. And I think when you have a clinical system that's used uh, also as a surveillance system. It's not structured for that purpose necessarily. And it can make, as I've mentioned, challenges in extracting data quickly and analyzing the data. And, and then when you have um, uh, different people accessing the same um, uh, uh, information system, there can be some differences in uh, data entry practices. And then the flip being when you have a surveillance system that then is what you're using for clinical care, it's really not structured for that purpose and there can be, it leads to challenges in providing care and, and really what that leads to from a program perspective is challenges in ways of looking at developing program relevant uh, metrics that can actually help us look towards a way to improve our, our, our care. And, and I think um, the last point I'd make is really just around these challenges with data infrastructure and data access and integration really um, is not just around clinical uh, information, but it includes laboratory information. And we're looking at ways in which we can try to um, uh, support some of our lab data, particularly uh, the, uh, the newer information that's coming through regarding genotyping and genomic data specifically. So within BC, we're, we're very lucky. We have, a, we have a, a functional and engaged provincial TB committee that just released our final report of our 10-year BC strategic plan that was really based on the Stop TB strategy. And, and again, the goals of our strategic plan are what you would expect around trying to uh, reduce incidence and prevent transmission and progression of disease. And one of the real key priorities of our strategic plan was trying to improve monitoring and evaluation of tuberculosis really just to try to improve our care. And one of the outputs of our strategic plan was the development of a TB surveillance working group. And, um, and this group obviously reported to the provincial TB committee and our provincial TB committee then reports to our provincial CD policy advisory committee. And this is a group that has representation from the First Nations Health Authority, from all of the regional health authorities, as well as the ministry. And there was a, a, a real encouragement to have a, a, a flagged surveillance lead from each health authority. And they worked towards developing a surveillance framework with indicators. And some of the outputs of this group uh, included uh, helping to streamline the annual reporting process. Uh, uh, the monthly and the quarterly reports that I have uh, shown you some examples of and contact cascade, I showed you a brief example of that as well. But I think one of the really important things that has happened is it's developed a community of practice people that are interested and passionate about TB uh, that come together and can help to problem solve. Uh, and with any strategic plan, you know, you set milestones and, you know, it's very clear from the first slide that I showed you, looking at the incidence of tuberculosis over a 10 year period, which sort of matched our strategic plan, is that, you know, we certainly didn't reach our first milestone of reducing a TB by 50%. We were nowhere close. We could, in, in our, in my most positive, I could look at Look at the fact that our incidence is stable. Uh, when I'm feeling sort of uh, less hopeful, I think it's stagnating. And, and certainly when you, um, you set yourself milestones, we, we set ourselves goal, we, we realized that we were having, we were struggling. 
uh, we actually met um, uh, halfway through the str our strategic plan and, and really did a, a bit of a reset to try and focus and tailor our, our goals. Um, and uh, our, our refresh report and our surveillance report and our, our um, final report of the strategic plan is available for people to review and, and see sort of what are the things that work well and what are the things that we uh, have had uh, ongoing challenges with. But I think what we have managed to do is re to recognize that uh, we really feel quite passionate about tuberculosis and we really would like to work towards elimination planning. And so we have uh, gone to our, our CD policy committee. Uh, we've requested and, and received approval to develop an elimination plan. And our next steps are really based on uh, the evolution of the global strategies towards TB elimination, which obviously are focused on, on data and understanding what our targets are and looking at what the targets are for low incidence countries like, like Canada. And I think what we have become very clear is we want to have an elimination plan, but we also want to make sure that our elimination plan includes and addresses quality care and program improvement. And the, um, the text on the right hand side of the slide really are what our key priorities and focuses are going to be as we work towards developing our elimination plan. Again, for the BC perspective, making sure that we're um, trying to address the upscaling of screening and preventative treatment in people born outside of the country. Uh, but having said that, we want to make sure that we continue to focus on the drivers of tuberculosis among some First Nations uh, communities, as well as some other underserved uh, populations. Uh, we really need to make sure that we're trying to address endemic TB transmission, and that means actually trying to address ongoing cluster and outbreak activity that we have. Uh, and then utilizing our advanced laboratory techniques and our relationships around genomics and IGRA to try and inform our program activities. And then most importantly, and I think related to the, con the conversation today, is really trying to develop meaningful and actionable indicators and targets that will help with our program evaluation. So uh, my last slide essentially is around um, ways forward. And, you know, I don't have solutions, but you know, we have lots of thoughts. And I think part of it is to begin the conversation and to, to look at ways in which we can solution together. I, I think one of the, the key points that has become very clear to me is from a surveillance perspective, we really need to think about going beyond the traditional approach to disease uh, uh, to disease surveillance and really try to seek to better understand the contextual drivers of, of TB disease. Um, we need to uh, look at actionable metrics, so benchmarks that we can actually use to, uh, to review our program to try to uh, address, not only address elimination, but also address quality care. And some of these solutions, again, they will be different depending on your context, might be looking at minimum data sets you know, for uh, latent TB or contact tracing, for example, or looking at standards of, of, uh, for data entry, uh, considering shared uh, data sources or databases, maybe trying to improve or simplify access to data. And then again, I think continuing to develop and foster that surveillance community practice, which I've outlined, which I think is incredibly important. And then from a BC perspective, what we're really looking at is trying to improve, continue to try to improve our infrastructure, to look at a more integrated TB data mart, if you will, so that we can support the ongoing development of automated algorithms and, and then indicators that can be maintained and standardized over time. So I'll just finish up by uh, saying that I, I, I thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, and um, I, I would certainly like to acknowledge uh, uh, not only uh, folks from the provincial TB program, which include our surveillance and epidemiology group, uh, the clinical team, uh, the public health laboratory, but also certainly to recognize that um, we have, um, a, from a provincial perspective, we have strong relationships and collaborations with, within our regional health authorities, as well as the First Nations Health Authority, and, and thanking, um, thanking them as well as, um, you know, the people that we, we, we serve uh, in, in, our, in our program as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook, for your presentation. Uh, it's it's really nice to, to see it anchored uh, in an example like this. Um, so we are running just a little bit late, which is not a problem because I think as everyone is, I'm very thankful for everything that's shared in all the presentations. Uh, I don't, and there's no need for the next presenter to feel rushed. Um, I'm going to suggest just to, so make sure that we have time for questions that uh, if possible, we add at five minutes at the very end of the presentation.
Um, I also want to encourage you to look at the Q&A tab um, where a lot of questions have already been answered and there's a discussion happening there as well in case you're, you're, you haven't seen it. So our final speaker for today is uh, last but definitely not least. Uh, it's a set of speaker, uh, but the um, policy advisor for Inuit Tepperit Kanatami, Raymond Obed, will be taking the lead. So Raymond is from Nain, Nunatsiavut, and grew up in a remote Inuit community. He has a BA in psychology, a bachelor of nursing, and a master's of nursing. He became more involved in systemic issue during a summer job working for the Nunatsiavit government on food security in the region. Through that experience, he became more familiar with what different barriers mean for the overall health of Inuit. At ITK, Raymond works at, uh, as a policy advisor on the public health file and Kwanut Pitat, a national Inuit health survey file of the policy advancement division. He is joined uh, by uh, Dr. Alex Petekin, who may jump in in the discussion. So Dr. Alex Petekin is Anishinaabe from uh, Wabaskan First Nation and graduated from the Norton Ontario School of Medicine in Thunder Bay, Ontario. He now works as a senior analyst in the federal sector, which has spanned Indigenous public health, epidemiology, data sharing agreements, regional Indigenous community engagements and participating in joint departmental public health response for emerging issues and COVID-19. He is currently on interchange with, IT, uh, with uh, the National Inuit Representative Organization, ITK, as a senior policy advisor leading in the tuberculosis elimination and public health file. His personal work has spanned First Nations governance, health policy, and he sits as a member of the health expert advisory panel for the Grant Council Treaty Number Three in Norton, sorry, Northwest Ontario. So thank you so much, Raymond. We, uh, I, I think everyone is very excited for your presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Claudine, and thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, today I'll be talking about the surveillance landscape of TB in Inuit Nunungat. And before I start, um, I want I wanted to introduce who we are and the people that we represent. So Inuit Tapirik Kanatami, ITK is a federally incorporated registered charitable organization representing and promoting the interest of 70,000 Inuit in Canada on a wide variety of environmental, social, cultural, and political issues and challenges on the national level. The majority of Inuit reside in these four regions collectively known as Inuit Nunungat. So the Inuit Valued Sediment Region, which is in Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Nunavik, which is in northern Quebec, and Nunut Savut, which is in northern Labrador. Inuit Nunungat includes 51 communities and encompasses roughly 40% of Canada's land area and 70% of its coastline. Consistent with its founding principle, ITK represents the rights and interests of Inuit at the national level through a democratic governance structure representing all Inuit regions. And so going into TB surveillance, this is the graphic that we use most often when representing TB incidence rates in Inuit Nunungat. This is where the 300 times incidence rate is seen and is represented across the four regions. Um, it also helps highlight the differences that occur can, that can occur across the regions based on population sizes. Inuit Valuit and Nunut Savut have the smallest populations in Inuit Nunungat. And this information is from 2018. Looking at, the, looking at the surveillance data from 2008 to 2018, um, this is just another graphic that we use with the previous one to share the trends over time. And it, you can see that it is consistently 300 times the rate, incidence rate of TB among Canadian-born Indigenous populations. And just continuing on, these two, two pie charts are to look at 2017 and 2020 distributions of TB cases and where Inuit fit in with the Canadian population and Canadian born individuals. Even though Inuit, Inuit are a smaller percentage, the incidence rates are higher based on populations. And the image from the public health agency, the one on the right, uh, will see changes due to updates in surveillance data, such as as cases resolve and are reported. And so this is more surveillance data. This is the most up-to-date information we have from the public health 
Health Agency of Canada for number of cases and incidents of active TB in Inuit Nunungat from 2011 to 2021. And just to point out that in 2020, with the pandemic, there was a drop, and this is when resources were moved to COVID-19. And then in 2021, there's an increase, which doesn't paint a full picture, but it can point towards cases stabilizing back to pre-pandemic levels. <clears throat> and moving on to denominators with TB surveillance, there are two versions of the Inuit population denominators that can be seen. And the examples I, we provide are based on the 2021 incidence rates. So Inuit in Canada is 135.1 per 100,000. And Inuit Nunungat is 153.4 per 100,000. So publications from the Public Health Agency, they use Inuit in Canada as the denominator. And it is important to identify which denominator is being used for historical data. And in the future, the two rates may be published alongside each other for clarity. But when it comes to ITK, anything we share will be the Inuit Nunungat denominator. And so this is using the previous data for 2011 20 to 2021. This is just to show the difference that uh, occurs between the two rates. Um, and you can see that uh, the Inuit Nunungat rate is higher than the Inuit in Canada rate. So there will be changes coming in the future for Inuit population denominators for TB surveillance. What is currently being used is a 10-year forecast of Inuit census data. And Statistics Canada has been working on a new, more accurate way of projecting denominator data between census cycles called now casting. The Public Health Agency will be moving to this method for Indigenous populations for the 2022 surveillance year. And they've completed a sensitivity, sensitivity analysis and found minimal change in rate estimates, 0 to 2.2% for the four land claim areas. And trend analyses should not be impacted. Going more into the data, data governance side of things, the land claim organizations receive, receive information directly from their provincial territorial partners through information sharing agreements. So what I was talking about previously was the national level and so this is just to give a more I get, give an idea of what the regional level looks like for the for the four regions. They work with real time information to provide programming where it is needed, and there are differences in regional agreements that reflect the land claim agreements. So, in Nunavik, the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Services, they are the provincial health service provider working with and they are working with the data and providing services at the same time. In Nunatsavut, they provide directly observed treatment and tuberculin, tuberculin skin testing through the land claim org, and the province does sputums, x-rays, and such. And in Nunavut and Inuvialuit, they provide programming like food baskets and or campaigns against TB stigma, whereas the priorities, whereas the territories provide medical services. And looking at the national level for Inuit data governance, we have the National Inuit Strategy on Research for advancing Inuit governance on research, which would also be TB research. The National Inuit Data Committee, Man Data Management Committee for developing capacity for data governance. The National Inuit Committee on Health for health priorities in Inuit Nanangat, TB following, falling under here. The Kanuipita National Inuit Health Survey a population health survey going through its first phase of data collection, and the Inuit Public Health Data Working Group. This is the main mechanism we are using for public health data, typic, currently TB and COVID-19. And we will look, and we're gonna look into, we're going to look to expand in the future as well for other communicable diseases. So currently in the data working group, we, we have ITK, Indigenous Services Canada, and Public Health Agency of Canada. And we're exploring adding Statistics Canada as well, since they do work with uh, population level data with the census and other um, things as well. So the items that we are working on in the data working group include the Inuit Public Health Data Inventory to track where 
Inuit public health data exists and other health surrogate data. The impact of COVID-19 on the TB elimination in Inuit Nunungat, looking at what resource movement away from TB from programming that occurred. And in the future, we'll be looking at looking to identify Inuit public health data needs, gaps, and barriers to access. Also looking at where data lies to build relationships and possible data linkages. So this is a very clear connection to the Inuit public health data inventory. Outside of the data working group, we are working with NCCID on evidence synthesis, synthesis of Inuit TB topics across both health and social topics. So looking specifically at hurdles and barriers to remove for TB surveillance, it's really it's very important to include Indigenous voices in the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy and making sure that it, that it aligns with Indigenous data, data governance as well. There's also making sure that accurate statistics are being used. It has an impact on advocacy efforts. A lag in public health data doesn't show the current realities that regions are facing with TB or a rate for the year will be shared, but will be updated later as more data is shared with the public health agency. As previous, previously shown, the population denominators can be different and it needs to be understood which population it represents. And lastly, coordination with stakeholders on advocacy. Data needs to suit the needs of those who use it. I've alluded to this, but what we ITK use data for is different from what the LCOs will use them for. That is advocacy and policy change versus informing programs and health system performance. This leads into improving community surveillance activities. It takes time for a person to go to a clinic, do a sputum sample. It goes out for testing, the results are shared back and further diagnostic tests are ordered. But you also have contact tracing going concurrently at the same time. These talks today are why it's important to remove these hurdles and barriers. The work we are doing at ITK and with our partners is one part of how we are tackling this. And I'll share more later on the regional side. And so we have a commitment with the government of Canada for a 50% reduction in TB incidence rates by 2025 and TB elimination by 2030. And we released the Inuit, tuber Inuit tuberculosis elimination framework in 2018. And there are six priority areas in that framework. Enhance TB care and prevention programming, reduce poverty, improve social determinants of health and create social equity, empower and mobilize communities, strengthen TB care and prevention capacity, develop and implement Inuit specific solutions and ensure accountability for TB elimination. The LCOs developed and implemented regional action plans following the framework based on what is relevant to their own regions. And the Canadian tuberculosis standards are another source for improving tuberculosis, TB surveillance and provincial terror. And provincial territorial TB manuals are being revised to follow recommendations. As a plug, Chapter 12 was co-written with ITK, the Assembly of First Nations, and the Métis National Council for improving cultural competence for healthcare workers and public health professionals servicing Indigenous peoples in Canada. And this, these all lead into the final topic on monitoring, evaluation, and learning, or MEL, and the work that is being done. These are the defin general definitions we have for MEL. So monitoring, collecting information, to understand progress towards the success a program wants to achieve. Evaluation, a way to understand if a program has done, is doing, and looks like it will continue to do things it is, it's set out to do, and if not, then why? And learning, using the information from monitoring and evaluation to make decisions about the future of a program. These three are used together to improve TB programming in the four regions. So the work to date, the Inuit Nunungat or the Inuit TB elimination framework was used to develop an Inuit Nunungat logic model. And the LCO TB managers then use the parts of the logic model that fit with their regional context to develop, to develop their own logic models. Indicators were developed against outcomes in the logic models. 
evaluation plans and learning plans were developed. I'll go into this a bit more later, uh, but the work that needs to be completed at the national level is that the, as regions finalize their own MEL plans, the Inuit Nunungat logic model will be updated and the indicators will be cross-tabulated into a pan-regional indicator list. This will represent the Inuit Nunungat story of progress towards DB, TB elimination. This is what the Inuit Nunungat logic model looks like with the ultimate outcome of improved health and well being among Inuit in Canada. And that's an ultimate outcome for ITK as a whole. And you can see the priority actions from the framework represented by PA1 through 6 throughout the entire logic model. The direct outcomes themselves are where the LCOs and ITK can have a direct contribution to TB prevention and care. MEL and surveillance go together. In the regional MEL plans, there are comprehensive considerations with indicators covering broad areas of system performance and system capacity. The goal was to make as many indicators that can inform system performance and capacity and find sources of information that can be attached to those indicators. The indicators are connected to different program activities with targets attached for expectations on amount and time. As an example, this is one of ITK's indicators as part of the work we are doing for TB elimination in Inuit Nunungat. And that's the, it's related to the best practice webinar series that we co-host with ISC. It is the proportion of webinars present, webinar presentations that have TB as either primary or secondary focus, the target being 100%, and it's to be reviewed annually. The expectation is to monitor progress evaluate at specific times, but learn and adapt throughout. So the LC, LCOTB managers were provided with a regional action plan template to bridge the gap between the logic model outcomes and indicators with their own internal work plans. This approach focuses on the resources required for the results specified by targets we want to achieve, also term-based results, termed results-based budgeting. This approach helps us ensure we are appropriately resourced to, to each expected result or outcome of the TBE program and manage expectations. It allows for the appropriate allocation of resources to each expected outcome, detailed financial monitoring, and straightforward assessment of attribution, all of which helps us achieve value for money. This is an example for using the template. The indicators are paired with the priority area and outcome for that clear link on what is being informed. Target and date are there and then, and then breakdown of activities, outputs and costs over time to accomplish the target. Risks are included to help with mitigation measures and accountability is there for who on the team will do the work. The idea is not to provide extra work for the TV managers, but support what they already have. On a final note, TB elimination requires more than just TB programming and care. It requires addressing the social determinants of health, for example, improving housing and food security. So addressing this public health crisis and eliminating TB from Inuit communities is a feat in cooperation and collaboration at all levels of government and healthcare from, and healthcare from cabinet ministers to frontline healthcare providers and community members. Akumik, thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond, for this excellent presentation. You've given us so much information and so much to think about. Um, I want to thank all the presenters and all the speakers for their excellent contributions. I also want to uh, note the excellent quality of the questions that we've been getting on the Q&A tab. Um, and again, I'd like to remind people that oh, there's conversations that have been happening there. And um, hopefully we can bring some of those conversations into the Q&A questions, into the, uh, you know, everyone speaking together about it. Um, so to get us started, I'd like to invite all the speakers, if you would like to uh, turn on your video, if that works for you, that would be a good time to do this. Um, and I think I'll get us started with a question that's already been discussed in the Q&A uh, section, but maybe we can, maybe others might have uh, more to add to this. 
Um, so it was asked uh, specifically around Jonathan's presentation, but I think everyone might have uh, things to add. Uh, I think the lack of Canada-specific ending TB strategic plan is one reason for the surveillance gaps, as there is no target to achieve and a strategy to guide. What's your thought on Canada to have its own end TB strategic plan? Of course, we now have just uh, had the pleasure of having an excellent presentation on ITK's TB elimination uh, strategy. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone would like to comment on that. No comments. Well, <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I mean, I can, I can start, but I think hearing from from Raymond and Alex as well would be uh, great. I, think I was just agreeing with um, Suvesh on the need for a strategic plan to end tuberculosis. Um, we need money for that, and we need a plan. I think Stop TB's taken, I guess, as a civil society role. Uh, I mean. From a Canadian perspective, all, all over Canada, um, on what's needed to develop uh, a plan to end tuberculosis, and I think it's key to have federal, provincial, territory representatives, impacted communities, civil society at the table when this is being developed, and it needs to come again with adequate resources, some sort of metrics to monitor progress, and then accountability. You know, we're, we want to come. We don't want to set a target or make a plan that's going to go to twenty thirty. And if we haven't reached it by 2030, we're going to step away and funding is going to dry up. It's not a, a one-time thing here. It's something that we need commitment for. And I wanted to just emphasize at the end that a, a Canada-wide plan should not infringe or take away from already developed and implemented plans that are going on elsewhere. And I think Dr. Wong brought up a, a great point after that there's a lot to learn from the leadership of groups like ITK um, have taken in this respect. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, um, Jonathan, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, you know, regarding, you know, for the rest of Canada, uh, we can all, uh, you know, be uh, learning so much, you know, from uh, Inu Nunangat uh, 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 and the leadership, you know, there uh, and what has been done, uh, you know, in developing the framework. And you heard from uh, Raymond Obed, um, uh, you know, about that uh, just a uh, uh, um, uh, over the past uh, um, 15 minutes, uh, how it was, uh, you know, carefully, uh, you know, developed, looking at the, the data and looking at the evidence and how, you know, all the processes involved and, uh, you know, the tracking of the progress, uh, as well as the efforts uh, in a distinctions-based uh, way, uh, regional-specific, uh, community-centered, uh, one size doesn't fit all type of approach. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, 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 Alex and uh, Raymond may want to actually, uh, you know, comment on that uh, further. I think for the rest of Canada, in other populations, there's so much to learn, you know, about uh, your, your process uh, of developing that. Go ahead, Alex. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having us and great presentations today. And welcome to all the participants. My name is Alex Petacuan. Uh, So just to answer a little bit more about the questions, what we have learned in our uh, particular process of developing outcomes and goals is that uh, while we were able to like build off of each other's um, common outcomes that you saw in the logic model, which is the ultimate outcome of like uh, well-being of imp improving the well-being for Inuit, but obviously what we really learned about the context and the geographical differences and the capacity and also what was really driving a lot of the uh, indicator development was the surveillance um, methodologies going behind it, but also the patient uh, or client population of uh, whether it's active TB or latent TB cases. So obviously, we're going to have very different approaches to how we do surveillance in particular populations. And when we set goals of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, for what we have currently of reduction of 50% by 20. 
by uh, 2025. Obviously, there's a challenge when in one particular region, there is uh, mainly latent TB cases. And these are very difficult to track um, when they are floating under the radar and they only pop up when an active when they turn uh, convert to active uh, TB. So our experience has been is while we were able to develop a ultimate common outcome indicators, uh, on, like the context and geography really drove what the individual context and approaches are going to be. So even though there, there is uh, this will and want to develop this national strategy that um, would hopefully serve all, unfortunately, the reality is like even going on, um, uh, south of 60, uh, essentially, we see a very different type of landscape and, con and connection to urban centers and uh, locales with uh, with higher TB incidence rates, where we have to change the uh, approach that's being taken. And also the communities, even in Inuit, are diverse and very unique. So we need to ensure that we are adapting our approaches to the changing landscape within those communities and ensure that the that they are full participants in TB elimination. Otherwise, whatever gains we do succeed with, unfortunately, will be lost in the future as uh, we lose engagement with those communities. And so uh, I, I think that the COVID pandemic is kind of like showing us this, how uh, there was a large uh, shift to COVID-19 and surveillance there, but then we saw a large drop in TB cases, and now we're starting to see outbreaks, de novo cases in new communities, and so we really have to uh, redouble our efforts to ensure that like, we are changing our plans to meet the needs of the communities now. And so our current MEL framework and regional action plans really outline that, um, and we, we're happy to speak offline if there's more questions later on but I'll hand over to Raymond for anything else. Um, it's a joint effort as well. It's uh, the work, the MEL work is primarily led by the TB managers in the land claim organizations, but it's working with the, the provincial territorial partners as well um, to making sure that once again, that if we have an indicator <laughs> that there's information that, that can support that indicator. Um, that's that's important as well, and so that's like that's kind of like the end part of the monitoring part, the monitoring strategy, like making sure you have that information, and that if you have an indicator, it's not something that can't even be used. Thank you, thank you for this. Anyone else wanted to add something on this? Topic. Maybe just uh, echo some of the comments that have already been made that um, uh, TB elimination is a, a nationally stated political goal. Um, and we're in a federation that means, um, you know, all of the provinces, territories and TB programs are contributing to that national goal. So an, a nationally coordinated TB elimination plan that uh, measures progress towards that goal is is important, um, but is needs to be flexible and context specific. And so I, I really think um, something uh, has to happen in partnership. Um, and um, yeah, I just thought all of the talks uh, today were really phenomenal and like adding specificity to an elimination plan at the local level is um, it was a really beautiful talk by uh, Raymond, and um, but I, I really think uh, accountability and partnership um, in some kind of nationally coordinated fashion is going to be necessary for elimination. Thank you. So maybe I'll sneak in one last question as I see that we're already over time, but we agreed on five extra minutes or I, I don't know if we agreed, but I pushed it on all of you um, because I think it's such an important topic. There's so much being said and discussed everywhere. Um, is there anything that we can learn uh, from the coordinated, coordinated response to COVID-19 uh, in terms of surveillance? And has that changed anything for TB surveillance? Um, and how can we be prepared uh, for other uh, pandemics and how that could affect TB surveillance? Million dollar question for all of you.
I mean, I would, I, I would just say it was an incredible learning experience for me to see the coordinated effort and response when people were committed to addressing an issue. And, and so I think from, from a TB perspective, it, it really helped you sort of understand how important it is to have information, share information, um, and to, to act on it. And, and so I know from, um, you know, when we talk about elimination planning in BC, it's sort of a little bit silly because, you know, we're a province within the country and, and how can you do a, an elimination plan when the majority of cases that are, that are being treated in the province are actually coming into Canada from other countries where from a provincial perspective, we don't necessarily have sort of any, um, any control over what happens or doesn't happen. And I think, um, we absolutely part of our elimination planning strategy is around, I think what folks have talked about, which is really around advocacy and trying to get um, our, trying to get the partners that are at the right tables to bring TB forward and to have the discussions. And as has clearly been outlined so nicely by, by Raymond and Alex, like really learning from uh, the fantastic work that has been done in other areas. And that's within Canada, but also, I mean, again, um, I think it was, um, you know, John, that showed what ha is happening south of the border as well. There are there are lessons to be learned from there too. Uh, to build on, uh, you know, what Dr. Cook, uh, you know, just uh, uh, said, uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic, really demonstrates that uh, near real time uh, data surveillance, it's it's possible, um, and the the importance of uh, not leaving anybody behind is very important in equities, you know, all the underserved uh, populations, in addition to First Nations, you know, and Métis. Um, and COVID really uh, has demonstrated that the need to be sitting down, you know, with all the affected populations, just like what Dr. Campbell said, it's it's federal, provincial, territorial, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and other affected uh, populations together at the same table collectively. Uh, doing this, both uh, surveillance as well as uh, more real-time surveillance, as well as uh, interventions. It can be done. Anyone else wanted to add something on this topic? Do it now. Okay. <laughs> Well, I sadly, I will have to bring this to an end, even though this is an endless topic, as uh, we can see. Um, so thank you again to all of our excellent speakers today for sharing your expertise. Thank you for all the participants for uh, joining us today for this webinar. Um, so again, the recording will be available on NCCID's website uh, shortly, as, as, as soon as possible. Um, when we end, the webinar, there will be a short evaluation that you'll receive. Uh, please do the survey if you can. It really helps us at NCCID to plan these webinars. Um, so without taking more of your time, thank you so much to our speakers again, participants. Have an excellent rest of your day. <laughs>